All right, uh, let's begin. Okay, uh, welcome to CS 3510. Uh, this is going to be an introductory lecture into complexity theory, um, kind of, but not really. Uh, we're going to talk about complexity theory in general today, and then we'll only talk about one specific problem for the next lectures in a unit. Um, so the point of this unit, NP completeness, the reason you learn this in 3510 is because we spend all this time proving upper bounds on algorithms. We have, uh, we find all these great upper bounds, but we d really don't have any way to find matching lower bounds. Uh, so you've given a problem. There's a difference between a problem and an algorithm, right? So you're usually given a problem that you want to solve, and we usually talk about like one algorithm to solve that problem, right? We talk about, um, Given an array, output it's sorted. Uh, a, uh, given an algorithm that sorts the array, there are many problem. There are many algorithms to solve that one problem, though. Um, so there's a slight difference between uh, what we're going to be talking about this unit and what we're going to be talking about in other units. Um, so uh, an algorithm has a runtime, but a problem. has a uh, time complexity. So an algorithm is a solution to a problem, but a problem is itself that can ha is something that can have multiple solutions, right? So given the set of problems, and we'll talk about what that looks like better, and given the set of solutions, we know that the solutions are the algorithms, but there's multiple solutions per problem, right? Something like this is what uh, you, you can think of the association between a problem and a solution. Um, the reason I'm emphasizing this now is because we're not going to be really studying algorithms. There's not a single problem we're going to be solving in this unit. We're actually going to be only discussing problems and the relationship among problems. Um, Um, so we're not going to actually solve any problem. We're just going to be able to relate uh, the hardness of problems to each other. The reason for this is really our greatest uh, failure as theorists to prove any significant meaningful lower bounds. If you think about it, uh, a problem, the time complexity of a problem is its lowest upper bound and its greatest lower bound, right? What is the greatest upper bound on a pro uh, the lowest upper bound on a problem? Of all the algorithms that solve it, which one is the fastest? You know, merge sort is faster than the other sorting algorithms. And given a problem, what is the greatest lower bound on it? Now, to give an upper bound on a, of a problem, it's easy. You can just talk about the big O time complexity of the algorithms that solve it. So to find an upper bound on a problem, all you need to do is give an algorithm. And if you want to improve the upper bound, you just take one of the algorithms and you improve it slightly. And then, great, you found a better upper bound on the problem. But how do you show? Uh, and a problem is basically solved if you can find matching lower and upper bounds to the problem. How, how do you find a lower bound on a problem? That's sort of a, our greatest failure. Um, it, to find an upper bound, you just show one algorithm exists. To find a lower bound, you have to show for all possible algorithms. None of them can do this faster. Every single one of them is required to take this many steps. That's really difficult to show, and it's basically why we have no lower bounds on any of the problems. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, again, our greatest failure. Think about all the lower bounds you know. Um, binary search has a log n lower bound. Okay. Uh, sorting has an n log n comparison lower bound. Um, that's it. I mean, that's all of them. We don't really have any better lower bounds on any of those. Uh, most problems have a linear time lower bound. Simply because it takes that long to read the input. I think binary search is the only algorithm I can think of that has a sublinear time running lower bound, uh, a sublinear time lower bound, because it takes linear time just to read the input. Now, if you have a problem that's formulated in a way that you don't need to read the whole input, it's po probably likely that the problem is either just a variant of binary search or uh, is poorly formulated in a way that the input is containing a lot of extra information. Right? To read in, if you're considering the array of n elements, you know, you need to at least read all the elements. It takes linear time to do that. Um, so we have no real way to prove lower bounds on problems. So the best we can do is conditionally 
uh, put lower bounds on these problems. So NP completeness is a conditional theory of hardness. It's not an uncondition unconditional, but I mean the fact that given a problem, we know there's no efficient solution for it. That would be like an unconditional uh, theory of hardness. What I mean is like if P does not equal NP, then the NP complete problems are hard. Now what that means we'll talk about in a second. Uh, then So it's a conditional hardness. And what does P versus NP mean? You may have some s sort of like a Vsauce level understanding of what the problem is. But uh, we'll talk about it in, in, in a, uh, enough detail today. And then we'll sort of keep this as background radiation for the next few lectures, right? In, uh, in another course, you may, we will go into more detail on the problem if you ever decide to take 4510. Um, Right, so here's the best explanation I found to like, how does a, what does it mean for something to be conditionally hard? Because again, if something's false, then the whole thing is true, right? What if P equals NP, then are, do we have the hardness still? Uh, no. So this is slightly uncomfortable sometimes to some people, but um, there's a book called Gary and Johnson book. It's called Computers and Intractability, and it is a, it's from like 1979, and it's an early theory of NP completeness, and a lot of the terms we prove today, the concept uh, of reduction and the Cook-Levin theorem and all these things. And uh, it, the, it's famous because the last third of the book is just an appendix of all known NP-complete problems. Um, and there are today thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of problems across many different domains, across many different things, that um, are all NP-complete. So like being NP complete is a special status that a problem receives. And again, we're not talking about solutions, we're not talking about algorithm, we're talking about the problems. And we'll formalize what a problem is uh, today as well. But a problem being NP complete elevates it to a special class, it gets a little badge, and it says that I'm special and that uh, I have the same properties as all the other NP complete problems. Among those uh, properties is that if you can solve any NP complete problem efficiently, you can solve all of them efficiently. They sort of are in like a suicide pact with each other to solve the problems. Um, an efficient solution for one is an efficient so solution for all. We have no efficient solution for any NP-complete algorithm. Uh, and there are some other properties that they share. Um, the Gary and Johnson book has in the preface, uh, let's see if this works, this uh, little cartoon. So Gary and Johnson worked at IBM and a lot of the algorithms research uh, at the time was done in industry. Crew School was trying to literally minimize the amount of wire that AT&T was spending to connect a city. By, and that's why he defined the minimum spanning tree problem, computed, uh, gave an efficient algorithm for uh, finding a minimum spanning tree, and then proved it using the cut property. So Gary and Johnson also worked at, uh, at IBM Bell Labs. And in the preface, they have this little cartoon. So the context is you're, you go to your boss, and I, this might have actually been their boss, but you go to your boss, your boss gives you a hard problem. Okay, and uh, you work on it for a week, maybe you goof off, I don't know, but you, you want to come to his office and you want to give some, you want to show some progress on the problem, make sure your salary is justified. But if you go to your boss and you say, uh, I can't find an efficient algorithm, I guess I'm just too dumb, that is not going to look good on you. So maybe you, you fail to find an efficient algorithm for a specific problem. Uh, okay, what else can you do? You have some other options. Uh, to avoid serious damage to your position within the company, it would be better if you could prove this Bandersnatch problem is inherently intractable, that no algorithm could possibly solve it quickly. You could stride in confidently to the boss's office and proclaim, I can't find an efficient algorithm because no such algorithm is possible. We'll talk today about one problem we know has no efficient algorithm, unconditionally so. So you here, maybe you can't find an efficient algorithm for the problem. Well, you can't prove something to be true if it's false. So maybe the algorithm provably takes exponential time or something. Um, uh, but proving, Unfortunately, proving inherent intractability can just be as hard as uh, hard as efficient algorithms. Even the best theoreticians have been stimmied by attempts to obtain proofs for commonly encountered hard problems. It's funny that this is from 1979. We basically see progress on proving lower bounds on problems. Having read this book, you discovered something. 
Almost as good, the theory of NP completeness provides many straightforward techniques for proving that a given problem is quote unquote just as hard as a large number of other problems that are widely recognized as being difficult and that, having, and that have been confounded by the experts for years. Armed with these techniques, you might be able to prove that the Banerjee test problem is NP complete and hence is equivalent to all the other hard problems. Then you could march into your boss's office and announce, I can't find an efficient algorithm, but neither can all these famous people. So again, there's a huge diversity of problems that are NP complete and showing a solution for one will show you a solution for all. We'll prove this mathematically, of course. I'm just giving you a high level overview of what we're doing in this unit because it's gonna be so different than what we've done previously. I give you a problem, you give me an algorithm. Now that's not gonna work anymore. I'm gonna give you a problem, you're gonna find a different problem and you're gonna relate the two problems to each other. That's basically what you're gonna do. Um, Right, so the whole theory of NP-completeness is conditional. To give you some examples of problems that are NP-complete, there's like, knapsack will prove is NP-complete. We gave an exponential time algorithm for knapsack. For complicated reasons, uh, we won't be able to do better. Um, uh, knapsack is NP-complete. Uh, Sudoku is NP-complete. Sudoku turns out is just as hard as knapsack. Uh, Super Mario, uh, finding cliques in a graph. Uh, subgraph isomorphism, there's uh, f uh, finding optimal bin packing for a, a Bitcoin block. There's uh, all kinds of problems that pop up everywhere. Um, and it's, it's so fascinating, the, the diversity of problems that appear, you know, protein folding. It, it, in all kinds of domains, all of these problems that appear so differently are actually just the same problem, it turns out. They're all related, and these are so many different sounding problems, but they're all the same. And that's one of my, one of the most important reasons that NP-completeness uh, is really important, right? It's just, it, it's, it's almost a unifying theory of, hard, of this conditional hardness across many fields that seem totally unrelated to each other. I can tell you two stories about um, NP-completeness. One was, uh, I was working on a problem, and it, it doesn't really matter what it is at the time, but it is now, but at the time it was like, uh, quantum circuit compilation, you're given a circuit, you want to run it on the actual computer, you have to do a complicated process. And given certain cir circuits of a subproblem, how do you compile them to run on the IBM thing uh, efficiently? Because there's actually incurring a huge loss. And w I spent like six weeks trying to solve this problem and I didn't make any progress on it. And I just almost, I, nothing was better than a brute force solution or any of the solutions I had were like, Unoptimal. I was trying to find an efficient algorithm for this problem. And finally, I like, was just sat up in bed one day and I was like, well, the problem's actually, my problem might be NP-complete. So like six weeks of work I wasted and then in like an hour I was able to prove it was NP-complete. So the problem, sometimes if you can't find an efficient algorithm for the problem, it, there's a good chance the problem might be NP-complete. And then you're done. Now, the great part about showing it's NP-complete, here's the second story, it depends who you are on what that means. Personally, I am lazy. So when I see a problem is NP complete, I give up. That means I don't have to do any more work. It's not my job anymore. It's hard. It's a hard problem. Were I to find an efficient algorithm for this problem, I would have proved P vicious NP. But I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. So I'm, that, the, the, road is end, the road ends there. And I was discussing this um, view with like another professor in, uh, over coffee, and she was like, no, you can't do that ever. That's not how people actually view NP complete problems. Um, what happens is you have to apply several coping mechanisms. There's, even though you can't solve the problem in anything faster than exponential time, that shouldn't stop people from trying. So there's a whole theory of approximation algorithms. Like maybe you can't solve knapsack efficiently, perfectly in, exponential, in anything less than exponential time. But what if you just guessed and tried to come really, really close to an optimal solution? Can you do that in polynomial time? Um, it's complicated, it's a complicated answer. There are also what are called SMT solvers. SMT solvers, we'll talk about the S in SMT solvers, but it's satisfiable modulo theory solvers. You may have heard of these. Basically, uh, if a problem has exponential time, uh, apply several heuristics and then throw a supercomputer at it. You, you give the problem to the high performance computing people and they'll try and solve it for you. And maybe sure you can't solve it ni nicely on your laptop, but if, you, if you're willing to allow three days of time and to use the PACE supercomputing cluster, maybe you can solve the problem as well. So again, just because a problem is NP-complete, I like to think you get to give up on the problem. That's where the road ends, but other people say, no, this is not where you give up. You just translate the problem. You hand it off to the engineers. It's someone else's job at that point. But either way, you can't uh, simply apply the, th the, the techniques and tools that we've learned from algorithms so far. Right. Um, any more questions on what we're doing before we get into the theory? The, 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 the good stuff? Yeah.
That's what we're about to do. I didn't talk about what that is yet, but it's a very difficult open problem in computer science, and we'll prove half of it, actually. We'll be able to prove the easy way. Yes, I did, I double checked, thank you. I, I, there's three videos that don't have audio, I don't want, want any more. That would be a whole unit worth. Um, okay, so what is a problem, first of all? Uh, so you give an algorithm, sometimes you think about a computation, is it takes as an input and it gives you an output. Um, so how do, you, how do you say that, okay, if you think of computation in a functional way, where inputs are mapped to outputs, you know, inputs are the arrays, outputs are the sorted arrays, how do you discuss that a certain problem, input to output style, is difficult? And we don't really do that, we sort of give up on that way. Well, those are called search problems, you're searching for a solution. Um, instead, we've phrased everything in what are called decision problems. A decision problem is basically a yes or no question. It's always a yes or no question. Um, now, you can tr transform every search problem into a decision problem, and the search to decision transformation may incur some cost, but we phrase everything in terms of decision problems only. This is the way the theory sort of unfolds and, and lays out. So for an example of a decision problem would be, a, given the fact that a problem is, if, when you can phrase a problem like a decision problem, you can be given what's called a problem instance. And then you can determine if it has the property of being a, uh, one of the good problems or one of the bad problems. So for example, um, this allows us to use everything from set theory. We can consider the set uh, rel prime to be uh, pairs of um, numbers, let's say x and y, such that uh, x and y are relatively prime. We'll say co-prime, state space. Okay, now relatively prime, what is this notation? This means I have a, an encoding of the object, okay? So you have all kinds of complicated mathematical objects. You have graphs, arrays, numbers, whatever, music files, whatever the computer takes as input can be uh, encoded in some way. So we just mean this notation is this is like a string encoding of two numbers, right? Just, uh, it's just the strings as a single input. It's pair, they're, they're tupled together, so to speak. Um, now this is, uh, two numbers are relatively prime. Uh, if you can determine membership in this set, you can solve the relatively prime problem, right? If I give you two numbers, and you can tell if they're re relatively prime, then you can determine all the elements of this set, and you can also determine all the elements that are not in this set, right? For example, if I gave you two, three, you would say two, three are not relatively prime, right? Um, so that's not in the set. But then like, uh, let's say four and s eight. Four and eight is in the set. Wait, no, it's too early. Two and three are relatively prime, so that's in the set. Four and eight are not relatively prime, so that's not in the set. Okay, good. Um, how would you solve the relatively prime problem? Given two numbers, how do you determine if they're relatively prime? That's it, GCD. So we can discuss not the runtime of this problem, but the time complexity of this problem. Um, we know you can solve this problem simply by computing GCD. And do you guys remember what the time complexity of the GCD algorithm is? I don't expect this. Do we have a guess? No, definitely not. So, uh, by the way, every algorithm needs to have a lower, probably has a linear time lower bound. So like to read the input takes at least linear time. So we can actually say that there's a linear time lower bound to this problem, right? We can say you have to at least read the numbers to know if they're relatively prime. So there's probably a linear time lower bound to the problem. Was there another answer? Do we have a, an upper bound? I think it was like n cubed, but I could believe it could be sped up to n squared. So I'm just gonna write n cubed. So we don't have a matching upper and lower bound for this problem. Uh, at least we don't, maybe someone else does. But uh, we can discuss the, di the, the, the time complexity of this problem because we know all, we can consider all possible algorithms to solve it, take the fastest one. And then we can consider all, if there's, if there's any at all, lower bound. Now again, most algorithms will have a linear time trivial lower bound. Um, so we didn't really show anything with that. But, we have determined that the, the problem of determining if something is relatively prime or not can be done efficiently, right? And uh, here's what we're gonna define. Um, if uh, time, 
of f of n is equal to the uh, class of problems uh, solvable in O of f of n time, then we define P to be the class of problems that have uh, um, polynomial time solutions. So if a problem has a polynomial time solution, uh, then it's in P. Any algorithm, any, if a, and again, this is not about algorithms, but if a problem has an algorithm that solves it efficiently, then we say that that problem is in P, right? Here's another example of a problem. Let's call it path. You're given a graph G and two nodes, S, T, and you say there exists a path in G from S to T, right? So this is another problem. You're given a problem instance here. You're given a graph and two vertices, okay? And you're asked, is there a path in G from S to T? And again, it's very important that I'm phrasing this as a yes or no question. But you're, the problem instance, again, is given a graph, two vertices, does there exist a path? What do we know about this problem? How do we solve this problem? What's, a, what's, a, what's an algorithm for this problem? That would work. Any basically graph traversal algorithm would work, DFS. All of them, brute force would also work. Brute force is a bad one, but the fact that we have a, a good solution to the problem means that we can conclude that path is a problem that is in P. P here, again, path is a set of problems. P is a set of sets. Each is a set of problems, right? So given a graph, uh, if you can determine if there is a path or not, you can solve this path problem. That's the way we phrase decision problems. I'm just making sure we are fully clear on how the notation and the setup of the problems are. Now, this may seem like we're complicating things by phrasing everything as decision problems and then talking about classes of sets of problems, but it's actually going to make things simpler, and it's the only way we could really phrase a lot of, a lot of the discussion around this. Um, P is a, a class. It's a very important class, uh, and it's the P and the P versus NP. We'll compare it to NP in a second, but it's the class that really captures what a problem means to be efficient. Like, if a problem has an efficient solution, then we consider it to be in P. There's three main reasons for this. Like, by efficient, what I mean is, like, you have an intuitive notion of what a problem is easy and what makes a problem hard, right? So you think, oh, this problem, I know the algorithms for it. It's an easy problem. Okay, graph traversal is an easy problem. Uh, sorting is an easy problem. These are what we would consider easy problems. Knapsack is a problem we would not consider an easy problem. Even though we have a complicated dynamic programming solution to the problem, Again, still runs in exponential time. We would consider this not an easy problem. So we would consider uh, P is like all the efficient problems for three reasons. One, um, if consider that like uh, if you consider the inputs of length n, there are two to the n possible inputs of length n, right? So if you have a polynomial time algorithm for a solution, it probably means you have a deep mathematical understanding of what the problem is. You couldn't get that. Every problem basically has a, all the problems that we care about will have a exponential time solution. Every single problem has an exponential time solution that we care about. Bre uh, brute force search, right? Um, sorting has an exponential time solution. Just uh, randomize the items and then check if it's sorted. It'll take exponential time, but that will solve the problem, right? It's, that solution does not imply any deep mathematical understanding of what the way the problem looks like. Uh, recursion techniques, we, and, in di and in dynamic programming techniques, we know that there's a relationship between a problem and its subproblems, right? Given the, given the path problem, we know there's a path to S to T if there's a path from S to some node and then from some node to T. And we know that, because we know that, we know that we have a deeper mathematical understanding of what the problem is. Uh, that's why uh, a problem if it has a polynomial time solution, we usually have, uh, we understand the problem rather than just an association of input to output, right? Now, I'm not going to write all that down, but you perhaps believe me for the first point. Uh, number two, um, polynomials are closed under the operations that we care about, right? Uh, if F and G are polynomials, 
So our uh, f plus g, f times g, and then f of g, right? So if you have an efficient algorithm for one problem and an efficient algorithm for another problem, and you run those two one after the other, you will get a runtime of f plus g. So if you do something efficiently and then you do something else efficiently, you should get an efficient algorithm. It's composition. It's kind of closed under composition. Excuse me, under addition. If you run uh, for every step of one problem, uh, you run an instance of another problem. Uh, excuse me, for every step of one algorithm, if you run, the, run another algorithm, that's going to give you a runtime of f times g. But that's going to be also a polynomial. So if, for an efficient algorithm for each step, if you do another efficient algorithm, the whole thing should be efficient. Now, if you run an efficient algorithm and then run another efficient algorithm uh, on every instance, that's going to give you f of g, right? So the, all the operate, if you take two good algorithms and put them together, you'll get a good algorithm. This is not true if you take one good algorithm and one bad algorithm, or several good algorithms and one bad algorithm. Imagine you took several polynomials plus 2 to the n. You're going to get a runtime that is exponential. And it's not a polynomial, right? So if you have two, a bunch of good things and you combine them, you still should have a good thing. That's true for intuitive computation, uh, efficient computation, and it's also true for p. That's why polynomials are closed. Now, one group, valid criticism you should be thinking of the fact is that that's an infinite union of classes, and it's not simply like n cubed. Yeah? I would say no. n to the n is definitely not a polynomial. n to the n grows faster than 2 to the n, which grows faster than every polynomial. Right? A problem that's solvable in 2 to the n time may not be in p. That, prob that solution does not, or n to the n time, does not prove it's in p. It proves it's, uh, it doesn't prove that it's out of p unless you can give that as a lower bound. But if it has a lower bound of, that, of n to the n, then it's not in p. Yes? Um, that's not true. Uh, but there are problems that we understand it properly and have exponential time solutions. Like unconditionally, we'll talk about one today. But they ha we know that this problem cannot be solved in, exp in anything faster than exponential time. Um, we've, they're very rare that they're, they're the problem. I can only think of two that I know. Chess is one. The other is uh, equivalence of regular expressions with, with squaring. Um, that's it. There's only two problems I know that have exponential lower bounds. Um, but what was your question? Oh, what I meant was like every problem has an exponential solution usually. And it's, and it, but the exponential solution, like if you give, if one guy comes up with an exponential solution, another guy comes up with a polynomial time solution, the guy with polynomial time solution probably has a deeper understanding of what this problem is, how it's structured, internally what parts are defined in each other. If, it, if another person comes up with an exponential solution, it may mean that they don't understand the problem. If the problem is in P, you know, they just simply may have, you can always guess and check for every problem, basically. And that puts most of the problems we care about in exp, in exponential time. Um, so, but to bring a problem from x to p implies non-trivial mathematical understanding. Compo uh, some recurrence, usually. Um, question? Chess, provably, we'll talk about it today, in fact, provably has no polynomial time solution. Yeah, under a certain framework. We'll, we'll talk about how to, when you phrase it as a problem, as a decision problem, things get interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll see it in, in a second when we define some more classes. Um, right, so you may have ever run, have, what's the highest runtime of an algorithm you've ever seen that's polynomial? Cubed? So, in this class, the highest algorithm we've ever done is, and this is a class, of course, on efficient algorithms. The highest one we've seen is n cubed, and it might be for chain matrix, um, Bellman Ford, maybe, on a dense graph. Um, now, uh, the, the, the highest runtime I've ever seen of an algorithm, uh, like practically, was like n to the 8, okay? Um, this is an algorithm for 
something called the Lenstra, it's called the Lenstra, 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 Lenstra and their brothers, Lenstra, Lenstra, Lovaz algorithm. I don't know which one goes to which L. Uh, and then Lovaz is just a, you know, he's another famous guy, but you know, it's called the LLL algorithm. It solves what's called the shortest, orth it finds a short orthonormal basis for a lattice. Uh, that's not important when it does, but just know that this was a problem that was thought to be very hard for a long time, and it was really cool that they were able to find a polynomial time solution. Now, this is not a good polynomial time solution. I implemented it, and then when you hit enter on the terminal, it hangs on very short inputs. Like, you can type a little bit, and then you hit enter, and it stops. So we would not consider an n to the 8 time algorithm efficient. No one would consider this to be quick. Um, for even small inputs that you could type on, on a keyboard, and so, like, you may s understand that and say, well, P obviously contains problems that are hard because it contains problems with, that are solvable in n to the 8 time and not faster. Uh, that's something you may conjecture. Um, and it, it is true that actually for any k, there exist problems that are solvable in n to the k and not solvable faster. You can prove that non-constructively, that there must by a technique called diagonalization, that there exist problems of every time complexity that cannot be done quicker. The, the thing is that these problems never really appear in practice. Um, once you have a problem and you bring it into P, it can probably further be optimized. So this is the original vanilla solution to the LLL algorithm. This is the original time complexity. Um, but once this paper came out, there was a huge series of papers of optimizing the solution. There was three papers on this technique this guy invented called pruning, where he, he starts pruning the algorithm. And uh, this other guy, he, he, he does this other technique, you know. Um, and basically, to bring the problem within P, again, implies a deeper mathematical understanding of the problem. But once you tell everyone what that mathematical understanding is, it's very unlikely that a problem will remain at a high degree polynomial. You know, there are only theoretical problems that exist at n to the 1,000. There's not a single practical problem that we can consider there. There's a reason that all the problems we consider go between, like, log n, n log n, n squared, all the way to n cubed, right? They're usually between those uh, things and not much greater. It's because once you explain to someone what, this, what, the, how, what the mathematical structure is, a lot of times they can help bring it down. Um, so my implementation of LLL was the vanilla way, I hung on a keyboard, I go to the number theory library, I see how they implemented it. They didn't just implement the vanilla way, they implemented uh, like, you know, a, a hundred papers worth of optimizations on the problem. Uh, and then when you hit enter on the keyboard, it, it finishes it immediately. And then you give it really, really large instances of like many gigabytes and it still finishes instantly. Um, now, it may be difficult to measure the time complexity of some of those optimizations. It, you, they can't say directly, oh, you know, uh, we brought it from n to the 8 to n to the 7 or something. It, some, sometimes those optimizations are at the constant level. You know, maybe a big O is hiding a constant for us, which we may not care about theoretically, but the, the, the engineers certainly care about, right? The difference between uh, my 11-year-old uh, Chromebook and the new laptop is going to be uh, like a 25 times difference in speed. In terms of big O, that's just a constant, so you can, we can hide that constant, so it's not that slow, uh, theoretically. But again, it, that's, a, that's a pretty big difference, I think, for 25 times speed uh, for, in terms of an engineering problem. And that's supposed to be the third reason. It's like high degree polynomial problems don't really exist in practice. I'm not going to write all that down again, but do you guys believe me? P is a good class. It's all the good problems that we want. That's my speech on P is a good problem. Any questions on P? Yeah, P is for polynomial. Definitely, yeah, that's the P. P is for polynomial. Now, NP is not for not polynomial. Don't think that. That's a, that's a common, common thing, yeah. The U is a big union. Each one contains a problem solvable in that class, and then you can just union them all together. Um, let's talk about NP. Uh, NP is the problems uh, verifiable in polynomial time. Now, what do we mean by verifiable in polynomial time? Uh, basically, P is the problems you can solve quickly. NP is the problems that you can grade quickly. Now, now that I'm on the teacher side of things, there is a huge difference between you having to do the exam and me having to create the exam, because I don't actually have to worry about solving the exam. I just kind of skim it and just believe that you could do it. But then grading it is much easier, it turns out, than solving the question. 
For a lot of problems, grading them is easier, you know. Um, by polynomial time, by verifiable and polynomial time, we mean that there exists, um, let's say A is a problem, we say A is in NP, if there exists a program called V, such that for X is in A, uh, V takes as input X and what's called W, which is a witness. Uh, so X is a problem instance, V is the polynomial time verifier, W is called the witness. Or the certificate. Or the solution. Um, what is a witness of a certificate? What, is this, what does this mean? This is basically the solution to the problem. Uh, and if you can find a solution to the problem, excuse me, we don't care about how you can find a solution to the problem. We don't care about that at all. We're simply assuming that there is this immortal godlike power who has given you a solution. And you simply can check if it's correct or not in polynomial time. So we want to ensure that V runs in polynomial time. And V checks if W is a solution to um, X, right? Um, right, so you're basically writing a grader. V is a grader. If you're asked to show a problem as NNP, you don't need to solve the problem. You just need to describe how an auto grader for the problem might work. Um, let's give an example of a problem that's in, uh, that's in NP, and you probably don't know that it's in P. Uh, it's called composites. It's the numbers N, such that N is composite. Now, what is a composite number? Pop quiz. It's not prime. So it's the complement of this. The complement of the set would be the set of primes, for example. Um, I claim, comp we actually, through very recent result, know that primality is in P. Very difficult problem. It took like generations and generations of, we, we've known about the prime numbers for millennia and only in 2006 did three guys called AK and S, no, excuse me, 2004, AKS04, did they prove that primality could be done uh, in polynomial time, like deterministic unrandomized polynomial time. Uh, Given a number, is it prime or not? We only know, knew how to do it this way, 2004. We've known about the prime since Euclid. Mil millennia has gone by. And before that, even all through the 20th century, the fastest algorithms that we had were still not a polynomial. Um, only recently did we solve this problem. Great mathematical achievement. Composites, I claim, is an NP. Composites is an NP, why? To prove a problem is an NP, uh, we'll do this problem in a structured way. You simply have to give a polynomial time verifier. So V is going to take as input uh, a number. And uh, what the first decision you have to make is what is the witness going to be? The witness is going to be a solution to the problem, and you're going to check if it's a solution or not. Oh, thank you. Now, what is a solution to the problem? Yeah. Yeah, a factor. Not even factors, a factor. I mean, that's, that would be fine, actually, if you said factors. But you can find a shorter solution to prove, to prove something is composite, just find a factor. Right? So we'll call it some number. Um, M, which we claim where uh, M is a factor of N. Now, you could have actually said M is not one number, but a tuple of numbers, which are all the factors. And then, let's suppose we did it this way first. How would you check in polynomial time if M is a factor of N? Hmm? Division? Uh, I don't like integer division. The, that would work, but there's, a, there's another way. Let's see if there's a more number theoretic answer. Modulo would also work. Um, there's a third answer I'm looking for, though. I didn't think of either of those two. Euclid GCD. 
That's what I was thinking. I think modulo is a better answer, though. You'd also have to check it like m is less than n and so on, all these sort of trivial syntax stuff. You have to check that m actually is a number and not accidentally an array or something, you know, yeah. Ah, who knows M? Yeah, we don't know M. I mean, there's a deep, there's a deep answer to this question. You have no decision. You're not, there's no information provided about how M is obtained. It's the input to this. You are giving V here, which is the deterministic verifier. It somehow, you're going to set up the method. It's like, it takes on the two inputs, the X and the W. Now, how do you actually run V and give it, determine an answer to grade? That's not your problem. It's very important that you understand that you're not actually solving this problem. You're actually just going to verify it. Yeah. The actual answer, like just a bit? Yeah. Well, then how do you check a bit? B, v, v, excuse me, witness is supposed to be an auxiliary. In, so like, if we'll prove, we don't think P equals NP, okay? So there are problems in NP, well, that's the whole point of today, that are not going to be in P. So the witness is supposed to be a piece of information which can convince a verifier of the correctness. Now, if you just give them a bit, that's not very convincing. It has to be a piece of information which will convince them of the answer. Now, how that piece of information is obtained is not obvious. It's not our job. And it's very important that you don't think about it. Um, I will stress again that NP does not stand for not polynomial. Um, it stands for what's called non-deterministic polynomial time, and it turns out that that definition is equivalent to deterministic verifiable computation. So that's the reason we, we use this NP instead of V or something. Yeah. Oh, you don't know AKS. That's right. That's why. We're doing a simple example. AKS is, I mean, if you said that, that would be maybe okay, but this is like, uh, it's a many page paper, very difficult, very difficult algorithm. So it's non-trivial, very, very non-trivial. But that would work, absolutely, yeah. Let's prove it. Before we prove it, we'll give one more solution to this one. Here's another polynomial time verifier, which would be acceptable. You say, well, I'll take as input n, and then I'll take in uh, some numbers, uh, let's say a1, a2, the ak, and then I just check if a1 times a2 dot, 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 times ak is equal to n, right? If those are the factors of n. Let's suppose you, that would be a, uh, an efficient solution at all, as, as well. Uh, it's important that the uh, witness is polynomial sized. A pol verifier must run in polynomial time. It does not have time to read an exponential sized witness. The witness must be of polynomial size. Yeah. Mm, three and two, GCD three and two is one. Is Uh, this is composites. We're trying to prove composites is this specific problem. We're trying to prove it's in NP, right? Uh, the path problem is in NP. The relatively prime problem is also in NP because you can give polynomial time verifies to that problem. Let's discuss the relationship between uh, P and NP. Uh, we prove that P is a subset of NP, okay? Uh, how are we going to do that? Let A uh, be in P. We prove A is in NP. Since this is for all A and P, we'll prove that P is a subset of NP. Now, um, this is an easy, this is the easy part of a very, very hard problem. Proving if this containment is strict has killed the careers of thousands and thousands of scientists. Uh, I can't describe how hard this problem is. Um, so we won't, maybe not, we won't go into it too much. We'll just go into the easy part. Uh, if A is in P, then there's a polynomial time solution for A, right? Uh, 
Uh, what's this polynomial time algorithm called? Uh, let's call it uh, I'm trying to think of another capital letter that's not confusing. Let's call it let's call it lowercase p. Um, so p is an algorithm that solves a. So we know that um, we give a poly time. V. V is going to take on input X and a witness. And what's our witness going to be? It's going to be nothing. We're going to ignore the witness. So there's no witness to this problem. We're just going to solve it. Uh, return P of X, whatever that is. Now, is this a verifier for the problem? Yes. Does it correctly return an, a yes or no answer? Yes. Why? Because P correctly returns a yes or no answer, and P runs in polynomial time. So V here runs in polynomial time. Um, the moral here is like if you can quickly solve a problem, you can also quickly verify a problem. The grader is simply going to ignore the answer and then just resolve the problem. That's how you can grade a problem quickly if the problem can be graded quickly. So this proves that P is a subset of NP. Right? Any questions on this proof? So, quote unquote, yeah. Is a program the there is a polynomial time algorithm to solve a called little p. P is the solver for a. We assume that a is in p. No, the wit there is no witness. The auto grader is simply going to ignore your answer and then resolve the problem. Ah, because we've given a polynomial time verifier for the problem, and that's sufficient to show the problem is in np. If a problem can be solved quickly, it can also be graded quickly. The grader is simply going to solve the problem again. Now, not everything, we don't believe that everything that can be graded quickly can be solved quickly, but everything that can be solved quickly can be graded quickly. It's not even going to get the same answer. It's just going to run the program that solves it. P is the solver for A. P is going to say yes or no. So it's just going to delegate. It's going to, okay, just tell me what the answer is. And whatever its answer is, it's going to return. Right? Yes. That's a great reason we phrase things as yes or no problems. Everything is a decision problem. Very rarely will we even discuss the idea of a search problem in this unit. There's, this is one of the reasons that we phrase things as decision problems. We get easy proofs like this. How would you do this for search problems? There is an analogous search version of P and a search version of NP, and you could prove something analogously. I don't know how to do it. It sounds complicated. There's lots of little baggage details, of translations of things, you know. Translating an outputted search solution to an outputted verified search, you know, it's, 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 it's baggage is what it is. Um, but there is an obvious search to decision transformation you can always make. So given that, the problem becomes, the, it's, it's fine to study the decision problem variance only, right? Yeah. X is an a, X is a problem. Uh, X is an A. We want to prove. We want to be able to determine if X is an A or if X is not an A. X is a problem instance. So you can think of a path. You can think of a graph in two vertices, and we want to know if there's a path between S and T, or if there's not a path between S and T. We just want to determine. It. And X is the whole problem instance. Right. Um, let's talk about exponential time. X is the class of problems solvable in time uh, 2 to the n to the k for k is equal to 0 to whatever. OK. We know that uh, p is a subset of np. We've just proved that. I claim, and we won't have to do this proof too complicated, that np is a subset of x. XB is the class of languages dis, uh, decidable in exponential time. And here, exponential notice is not just 2 to the n, but 2 to the n to the k. 2 to the n is called a different class called just e, and we never talk about it. Like 2 to the linear exponent would be 2 to the o of n would be just a capital E. But exp is 2 to the n to the k. That's our definition of exponential. Um, I claim that p is a subset of np, and np is a subset of xp. Why is NP a subset of XP? Uh, 
Yeah, here's the exponential time solution. I'm not going to write this down. But if it's an NP, then there's a problem in NP that has a polynomial time verifier. Okay? Now, you can convert that polynomial time verifier to an exponential time solver. How? Just brute force search for the witness. The witness must be of polynomial size. So just brute force search for the witness, and then you can, like, if you have an auto grader, you can, and if it tells you yes or no, you can just brute force search over its answers for the right one. Like, sometimes if you have a true and false, um, multiple a, a, a quiz that's true and false, but it tells you what your grade was, you can binary search over the answers to get uh, 100 on the quiz, right? Something like this. So you can just brute force search for the answer. Um, brute force search for witness. Uh, the witnesses of size, let's say n to the k. So it takes 2 to the n to the k to search for such a witness, right? Um, OK. Now, we can actually prove that p does not equal xp. We can prove this. We, uh, and I, in fact, this is not so hard. I think I give this as an exercise in 4510. Um, we can put problems in xp that are not in p, both non-constructively and also constructively. Two problems that are in xp. One is actually uh, the chess we talked about. So let's talk about chess. Chess is a problem that's in xp and is not in p. Now, what does that mean? We need to first formulate chess as a decision problem. So here's one attempt at formulating it as a decision problem. There's two ways, there's two problems with describing chess in terms of a decision problem. First is, what does it mean for an answer to be good or bad? And what we'll say is, given a specific board instance, determine if white is winning. Or if white is not winning, then black is winning. So you know on Lee Chess or whatever, you got that little bar that goes up and down when you make a good or bad move. It'll tell you that's what we're trying to do. That, that algorithm has an exponential time solution. Whether or not it's greater than 50% you're winning or greater than 50% you're losing, or less than 50% you're losing, right? Um, there is one problem with that formulation of chess, though. Like, given a board instance, determine who's win winning. Um, what is the problem with that? Do we know? Mm, let's suppose we just delegate that to one side or the other. So the problem is that chess is actually a finite game. Chess is a, in, in theory, chess is solved. Uh, that what I mean by this is there's only finitely many pieces, there's only a finitely sized board, and so there's only finitely many positions you could have. You could brute force search over all of the positions, encode those into a program, and then just read or write if they're winning or not. So finite chess can be solved in constant time. Uh, Practically, no, because there's, so, there's more positions than atoms in the universe, so you couldn't encode a program. You couldn't even write down a program that could do this. That's fine with theorists. So uh, theoretically, chess is, constant, is a constant time. That's a constant time algorithm for chess. Now, does it capture the actual hardness of chess? The answer is no. So what we don't actually consider is chess itself, but what's something called generalized chess, where you could don't consider an 8 by 8 board, but you consider an n by n board. All the problems have to be parameterized by some n to, to have larger problems have a harder difficulty, right? Like imagine we did the graph problem, um, but like uh, for graphs of only four nodes or something, right? It would be solved. It's a solved problem when you fix n. So we consider the problem as it grows as a function of n, as a function of the board size. Now, is that practical? I, th I would think that the strategies of n by n chess are far worse than the strategies, are far different than the strategies of 8 by 8 chess. Sometimes the small board is in and incurs a thing. So then you have to make an association between, OK, what does generalized chess actually say about chess? Um, that's not easy to do. But either way, we can provably say that there is no polynomial time algorithm for chess. Proving that is quite difficult. Uh, but we can prove it. We can do it, and there is no polynomial time algorithm for generalized chess. Excuse me. So, given that, we can also find an exponential time algorithm for chess. We have an element in xp which is not in p. So we know that p does not equal xp. We can prove that. There's other ways to prove that, but that's one way by showing that chess is uh, can be done this way. This also gives good evidence that we can't really improve, you know, like Stockfish or these other chess algorithms that try and look forward in the board for you, telling, but they tell you who's winning by calculating up to a certain depth and then say, okay, 40 moves down, uh, you know, you win 
63% uh, of the position. So we'll give you a score of 63 out of 100, something like this. Um, we know we can't do better than exponential time for those algorithms as well. So the, all the work being done on Stockfish and those other algorithms is just like constant optimization. Some, some things like this, you know, uh, trivial speed ups. Uh, there's one more thing that we want to, I want to talk about on just like general complexity theory before we get into some of the, the meat. We know P is a subset of NP, which is a subset of XP. But we know that P does not equal XP, right? But P is the thing all the way on the left, and XP is all the way the thing on the right. So we have a chain of inequalities. But we have that the endpoints are not equal. So it's sort of trivial set theory here. What do we know about this? Either uh, P does not equal NP, or NP does not equal XP, or both. Right? So here, uh, P versus NP is actually a very rela related problem to, like, it turns out thousands of other problems uh, on structural complexity theory. NP is equal to XP implies that P does not equal NP. So if you could prove NP, that there, that if you could prove that everything that is, uh, we proved one containment of this. Suppose you were good enough to prove the reverse containment, that everything that's solvable in exponential time has a polynomial time solution, excuse me, a polynomial time verifier. Could you do such a thing? You could prove P does not equal NP. Now, to go back to our example of chess, we don't believe chess is an NP. Because it doesn't make sense for what a witness to be. Like, let's say someone gives you a board. Uh, what is like a, a board as in a sequence of uh, a p the encodings of the pieces on the board, the current moves? What does it mean for there to be a witness to that problem? What is a easily verifiable solution to determine who's winning to that problem? It's not obvious what the witness to even formulate to that problem is. Other problems have an easy witness. It's just the answer. Uh, but what is the answer to that problem? If you think about it intuitively, there isn't like a good short answer you can describe to someone to, to explain why one person is winning or the other. So an algorithm to solve chess, generalized chess, basically to verify the solution, basically has to repeat all the brute force search. You know, um, like a similar problem occurs with graphs, but this is polynomial. Given a graph, and I let's say the witness was a path in the graph, how do you convince someone that the path is the shortest path? You basically have to repeat the path graph search algorithm, right? You can't really do any better. Um, so we think that we, we're, we're certain that these three classes are distinct. Zero way to prove it. We have no idea how to prove it. Um, we've basically given up on trying to prove these problems. But uh, yeah. More questions on P versus NP versus XP? OK. Uh, let's talk about uh, a theory of NP completeness today. So NP completeness is basically um, uh, a problem. A is NP complete if A is harder uh, than the hardest problems in NP. Now, the way to think of this is if we put this on a scale, let's say we put P here, and we know that P is a subset of NP, so let's suppose we put NP like this. The NP-complete problems are those that are harder than the problems in NP. So these are going to be called um, uh, the NP-complete problems. Right. Now they intersect with, uh, excuse me, the, not the NP-complete problems, the NP-hard problems. Now. NP and NP hard, NP hard is not a class, really, 
Like, and it's bad, it's, it, it's impolite to describe it as a class. It's a property of a, of a, of a, of a problem to be NP-hard. But if you consider it like a class in this Venn diagram sense, it does intersect with NP exactly at the NP-complete problems. So you want to prove a problem is the hardest problem in NP. What do you do? You first, you need to be the hard, it needs to prove it's the hardest problem in NP. It needs to first be in NP. So you first need to bound its difficulty between here and here, somewhere. This can be done by showing that A is in NP. If you can prove the problem is in NP, you know it's not anywhere harder. Right? You could probably also show the problems in XP, uh, but that's not going to give you anything. You need to show the problems in NP, and you need to do so to give a polynomial time verifier. Okay? Just give a way to auto-grade the problem in polynomial time. That's how you can prove the problem is in, is in, is in NP. Now, how do you show that it's um, uh, NP hard? To show it's harder than all the problems in NP, but also is in NP, you say, um, for all, uh, let's say, L in NP, that there's a what's called a polynomial time reduction. And we'll talk about that is there's a polynomial time reduction from L to uh, A. This symbol is a less than equal sign symbol with an underscore P. We'll talk about exactly how to prove a reduction. That's the point of today. But uh, you're going to be doing lots and lots and lots and lots of reductions. You're not going to be solving any algorithms. You're going to be giving reductions. And a reduction is a relationship among problems. Now, uh, you can think of this relation on this sort of scale of hardness, right? If you have L, there's a reduction from L to A, there's a polynomial time reduction from L to A, what that really means is that A is harder than L, or L is easier than A. That's what we mean by this reduction. So you can think of this scale as putting A and L on different parts, right? Well, we, if we can prove that A is an NP, and then there's a polynomial time reduction from all problems in L to uh, all problems L and NP to A, that means A is in NP, but also NP hard. So that means you can put it right here. Right? That's what it means for a problem A to be NP complete. Now, in practice, are you going to actually show this to be true? What you're going to actually do is choose a different NP complete problem and perform a, a reduction to it. So you're going to say choose, you can do this way, which you won't do, but or you can choose known NP complete problem, let's say C, uh, and prove that there's a polynomial time reduction from C to A. Now, why does this work? If you're going to prove a set of NP-complete problems to be NP-complete, and then you're going to prove more NP-complete problems to be NP-complete. And as we go through this unit, you're going to develop a large class of problems that you will know to be NP-complete. And then when you want to prove a problem in the future to be NP-complete, you can simply draw on the problems you know. You can say, well, this problem is actually just a slight variant of the problem we did. It's nothing, there's nothing there important. So we can just, the reduction is easy, right? Why is this true? It's true by transitivity. Why does this one definition show this definition? Transitivity. If there's a reduction, if A is, if C is NP-complete, then you know that there's, that it's true that for all L and NP that there's a reduction from L to C. And if you have a reduction from L to uh, C to A, that implies that you have a reduction from, from, from L to A, right? Something like that. Um, both of these are required to show that a problem is NP-complete. It needs to be easily verifiable, but harder than all the other NP-complete problems. This is the special class where all the hard problems go. Knapsack is NP-complete. Three color mirror graph is NP-complete. Super Mario and Sudoku are NP-complete. Satisfiability is NP-complete. There's a million problems across things that are all in this special group right there, that tiny little uh, intersection of the Venn diagram. Any questions on this before we get into the definition of what a reduction is? How do we show reductions? Yeah. What are some NP hard problems that are like not NP complete? Chess is one that's NP hard. We don't know how to verify it. In fact, Mario will prove is NP hard and not NP complete because we don't know how to verify it. Um, uh, many problems are NP. There are unsolvable problems. Halting problem is NP hard. Um, satisfiability of, an, uh, of a logical formula with any quantifiers 
uh, is, is NP hard. Um, there are more. Oh, yeah, to into it. The, the interesting ones are all within NP. With that are also interesting ones are if a problem is NP hard and not an NP, it means it's not easily verifiable. Verifiable. It might be too hard to care about, right? I also, one more comment I want to make is that NP completeness and NP, being an NP and NP completeness are not the same thing. There do exist things that we think can't prove, but think go here. That are NP, in NP, but not NP complete. Some examples of this are graph isomorphism. We think, like, given two graphs, are they identical? Can you map one onto the other? All edges perfectly aligning. Uh, this is a problem we think is an NP and not NP complete for complicated reasons. We don't believe that problem to be NP complete. We believe subgraph isomorphism to be NP complete, but not graph isomorphism. Um, factoring is a problem like, like the RSA problem. Factoring an, uh, an, uh, a number into its prime divisors. We think this is an NP intermediate problem and not an NP complete problem. We don't know how to ver ver uh, efficiently verify such a solution. Uh, but we do know that, uh, excuse me, we know how to verify such a solution efficiently, but we don't know how to prove it's NP-complete. It doesn't appear that there's enough structure. All right, any more questions on this chart? You should etch that one into your brain, and we'll go into the definition of reduction, yeah. Which one, this one? If it's out here somewhere. It's not NP, no, no, being in NP is required to be NP complete, but a problem is NP complete if it's in NP and NP hard. A problem is NP complete if it's both, but there are things that are NP hard and not in NP. Some rare things that we won't care about too much. Okay, so we say for A uh, and B, any problems, regardless of the classes they reside in, uh, we say that there's a polynomial time reduction from A to B if um, uh, there exists a polytime computable uh, function f such that uh, x is in a if and only if uh, f of x is in b, and x is not in a if and only if f of x is not in b. Um, this is the definition of a reduction. Um, Importantly is that the reduction is this function that you're going to give, and the reduction is a transformation of one problem to another, right? Uh, importantly is that it has this two, two very important parts that every reduction needs to have. First is this correctness property, okay? Uh, you should think of it this way. If this does all the things in... If this is all the things in A, and this is all the things not in A, and if this is all the things in B, and this is all the things not in B, then the reduction is going to map the good to the good and the bad to the bad. Not every bijection is going to be uh, have this correctness property, and uh, not every, and it's not necessarily not a bijection if it doesn't. So by good to the good, we mean f will take an element of A to an element of B. Not every element of B necessarily, it doesn't even need to be surjective, but a good solution must map to a good solution. And a bad solution must map to a bad solution. The next three lectures, we're just gonna do tons and tons and tons of reductions. It's gonna be all about these reductions. F is a reduction that maps the good to the good and the bad to the bad. This is the definition of a reduction. It has to have this property. This is so important. And if people miss points, it's because they accidentally map something good to bad, 
or something bad to good. There's like one case missing or something like this. It has to preserve this property. So you can translate the hardness of a problem without actually solving a problem. Now this is useful if A and B are both really difficult problems and we don't know how to solve them. We can relate these hard problems to each other without actually solving it because we can, if you notice that F can be used in a solver for one, right? Uh, B should be thought of as being harder than A, and A should be thought of as being easier than B. Here's a, a proof. If there's a, there's a polynomial time reduction from A to B, and uh, B is in P, then A is in P. So if B is in P, and A is supposed to be easier than B, then we know that A must be in P. Now this can't say specifically within, within P, it can't say cubic, quadratic, or anything like that. It's just P in P. On which side of the line do you fall? Are you in P, or are you in NP and not P? That's all this reduction can really tell you. Um, we're going to prove this by giving a polynomial time solver for A. How? Uh, we'll say decider for A on input x. It's going to simply compute uh, f of x. Uh, if f of x is in b, uh, return true. Else, return false. How does this uh, decider work? And by decider, we mean it correctly decides everything that's supposed to be in a. It says yes on everything that's not. It's supposed to, not supposed to be in a. It says no on. Why does this run in polynomial time? First off, computing f of x takes polynomial time by assumption that it's a polynomial time reduction. We, exist, we know that f of x is a function such that x is in a if and only if f of x is in b. That's the, that's the reduction, right? So this reduction function f takes polynomial time to compute. You compute the translation. Then you simply check if f of x is in b or not. And if f of x is in b, and this can be done in polynomial time. Deter given the translation, is this in B? You run the polynomial time algorithm for B by assumption that B is in P. Given that, then you can determine that uh, if X came, X was in A or not in A. Why? If X is here and you compute the translation, and if you're in B after the translation, then you know you came from the good. But if you were in the bad and you compute the translation and you're in the bad, then you know you came from the bad, right? The, the reduction preserves the correctness for you. So you can compute A by computing B plus the reduction. That's one of the reasons we do this. Now, if B, if we have an A is mapping reducible, is uh, polynomial time reducible to B, and if we think A is hard, then we think B is either the same difficulty or harder on this scale, sort of intuitively, not very formally. We think that B is supposed to be a harder problem. Right? Any questions on the definition of a reduction? We'll go very into it. That's going to be very serious for the next several lectures. Any questions on, on this proof? Not necessarily. It may not need to be invertible. No, definitely not. You can have A and P and B and NP is an NP complete problem. Once we give examples of NP complete problems, it'll make sense. Question? The reduction is one function that takes problems in A and translates them to problems in B, not solutions, but to problems in B. You'll have to come up after class, I can't hear you. One moment.